here in just a moment, but in this particular instance, God uses this affliction to bring Jacob closer to himself. Well, what does he, he say? Verse 28, your name will no longer be Jacob. He said, your name will be Israel because you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then we see in verse 30, Jacob names Peniel. He says, for I have seen God face to face. He said, yet my life has been spared. So Jacob, Jacob goes through this uh, experience, this, this trial, this affliction. He, he's wrestling with God. And then we come to verse 1, which we've already read. But, but look at verse 1 closely now through that lens. Look at verse 1. Now Jacob looked up and saw Esau coming toward him with 400 men. Jacob just has this experience with God. He, he wrestles with God. God renames him. And then what happens? He looks up and he sees Esau coming. And not just Esau coming alone, but Esau is bringing the heat. He's got 400 men coming his way. Can you imagine being Jacob in that moment? I mean, you go from this, you're wrestling with God all night, which has got to be taxing in and of itself, and you have this holy encounter, and the Lord says, I'm going to change your name from Jacob to, to, to Israel. And then Jacob says, I'm naming this place uh, 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 Peniel because I've seen the face of God, and he's spared my life. He's experienced the grace of God. And then what happens? He looks up, and he sees his brother coming, and he ain't coming alone. He's coming along with 400 grown men that are ready to attack. You know what I'm talking about. And, and so Jacob, I, I can only imagine being Jacob in this moment. He's you know, scared to death because if you remember, uh, 20 years ago, Esau makes this bold statement. Next time I see you, you're mine. I'm killing you. That was, that was the last thing he knew. And so here Esau looks up and he sees he sees, uh, or Jacob looks up and he sees Esau and he's 400 men. Now, what's the first thing to note here? The first thing is this. The first thing is you can't worship God on the mountain and then abandon him in the valley. Now, look, I don't know where you find yourself today, but if you find yourself in the valley, I'm so glad that you came today to church, those in the house and those online with us. Because you need to hear this and be encouraged in this. It's easy to worship God on the mountaintop. It's easy to worship God when everything's going your way or everything seems to be going right. Right? When everything's peaceful. Uh, but the true test of worship is those valley experiences. When things don't go your way. When things don't go your way. When you're faced with hard decisions. When the challenges just seem to continue to add upon themselves. It's in those moments, church, I want to encourage you, plead with you, worship Him. Worship Him. The best thing you can do in the valley is not give up. The best thing you can do in the valley is not to, to come apart. The best thing you can do in the valley is praise Him. Is praise Him. Shift your perspective from the, the, the challenges of the storm, the circumstances around you, and put your eyes on Jesus. If you find yourself in the valley today, if you're on the mountain, everything seems to be going well. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Because the valley experience is coming, and it might be coming sooner than you think. So keep your eyes. On the Lord. What do we see next? We see that Jacob goes on. He, 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 he runs ahead of all these women and children. And Jacob bowed down, but Esau ran to meet him. And then they have this encounter that Jacob did not see coming. We, we, we see in this, this encounter as Esau runs to meet him. What does he do? He's not coming with the dagger. He hugs him. He embraces him. He kisses him. Part of the culture. And, and then what happens? Don't miss this. Then they wept. 
Do you see that in verse 4? Then they wept. Now consider for a moment all these two have gone through. Maybe you're new to church or new to the Bible, and I'm so glad you're here. Maybe you've been with us the entire teaching series, or, or you know Genesis backwards and forwards. I'm so glad you're here as well. But consider, consider just for a moment, all these two have gone through. Then they wept. What have they gone through? Well, Jacob tricked his brother and he's selling his birthright. And so all the inheritance is no longer Esau's. It all now is Jacob's. He tricked him. Then what did he do? Jacob deceived his father and stole Esau's blessing. Do you recall that? Esau comes back in after hunting, prepares this, this food, and begs and pleads with his father, don't you have one more blessing and Isaac says, no, I don't have already given it to Jacob. Do you, you, you recall all that these two have been through? Esau marries outside the family. Jacob leaves the family, doesn't even tell everyone why, probably wives, at least for Esau. He runs, and for 20 years he has been distant. And they finally meet, and they embrace and they leave. Then Esau looks up and he asks Jacob, Who are all these with you? I, I, I can only imagine in this moment what Esau's thinking. Man, uh, what, what, last I knew, you didn't, you, you didn't have anyone, any children, and now you have all of these. And look at Jacob's answer. The children, God, has graciously given your servant. You see Jacob's response. The children God has graciously given me. Given your servant. I'm reminded in this, in this part of the text how precious children are. I'm, I'm reminded that children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from Him. Psalm 127 Three. Parents, I want to encourage you and remind you that as challenging as your children might be, they are a gift from God. They are a gift from Him. And, and, and if you're not willing to step up and, and, and teach them and love them and discipline them and help shape and guide them, then who will? But the culture around us, and it's so important that you're reminded and encouraged this day that your children are a gift from God to you specifically. And what will you do with them? What will you do with the gift or gifts? What will you do with these children? Jacob knew that God had graciously given these children to him because he was undeserving of him. We see a shift in Esau. He asked Jacob in verse 8, what is all this about? What, what is all this about? He, Jacob responds it's to find favor with you. He, he, he knows the past. And, and then verse 9, look at Esau's response. I have enough, my brother, Esau replied. Keep what you have. I have, I have enough. So, somehow, Esau's heart has shifted. Esau's heart has changed toward his brother. My perspective is that the Lord has changed his heart. Someone who was so cold against another. Only the Lord could change a heart like this. We see in Genesis chapter 27, verse 41, Genesis chapter 27, verse 41, Esau held a grudge against Jacob. Now, this is the last time they were together. 20 years have gone by. Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. And Esau determined in his heart, 
The days of mourning for my father are approaching. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. I will kill my brother Jacob. That, that's how things ended. That's how the relationship ended. And the 20 years has gone by. Jacob doesn't know if his brother is still coming to kill him or not. But look at his response. I had enough. I mean, the man stole his birthright. The man stole his blessing. But somehow there has been this heart change. It must only be because greatness of our God. Our God changes us. He transforms us. It's His power and His power alone that can take one who is filled with hatred and wants to murder, to greet Him, hug Him, weep with Him, and say, no, you don't owe me anything. I have enough. Verse 10, Jacob pressures him. He says, no, please, I have found favor with you. Take this gift from me. And then look what Jacob says. For indeed, I have seen your face, and it is like seeing God's face, since you have accepted me. You talk about a moment of grace, a reminder of grace. Jacob completely undeserving uh, of, of any of this, completely undeserving of Esau running to him, Esau uh, uh, embracing him. And what happens? He's reminded, as he looks at Esau, he's reminded of the Lord. He's seen the face of God. As we look at this, I can't help but think of how much God loves me, and He loves you, and He loves His humanity. God loved Jacob too much to leave him as he was. God loves you too much to leave you as you once were. This is the story of the gospel. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The first part of Romans 5 8 says, But God demonstrated His love for us. He showed the world how much He loved us, knowing we would reject Him, knowing we would choose sin over the Savior, that He still came to earth, walked this earth, was crucified on a cross placed in a grave, and rose victorious on that third day for you and me and all humanity. God loved Jacob too much to leave him as he was. He loves you. Listen closely. If you need this reminder today, God loves you too much to leave you where you were. God often uses affliction to bring us to him. He often uses the most painful moments of life to draw us closer to, to, to Him. We, we've already looked at the wrestle in chapter 32, but it was through this wrestle that God prepared Jacob to encounter Esau. It, it was through this struggle that God had prepared him to encounter his, his brother. See, affliction can lead to death or, or life. Have you experienced this before? Someone you know, maybe they've experienced this before. Affliction can lead to, to death or to life. Affliction can lead to anger or, or joy in those hard moments of life or in the, the losses of, of life. We've all experienced the loss of a, of a loved one. And, and through that affliction, through that pain, uh, um, uh, we either experience death or we experience life. We experience anger or we experience joy. Listen, church, closely. If, if it's anger then what happens is it pushes us away, away from God. And, and as we're away from Him, we realize that there is no purpose. What's the point? What's the purpose? And, and, and can I just boldly say there is no purpose apart from God. There is none. But, but through the affliction and the painful moments of life, 
if it's joy rather than anger, life rather than death, this is what happens. Somehow we're pushed closer to Him. We're drawn closer to Him. And in that, we experience fulfillment in life. There is no purpose. There's always purpose. The pain we endure. Write this down and consider it this week. Even as you think through your life and take time to consider your life, there is always purpose for the pain we endure. James chapter 1, verse 2. James chapter 1, verse 2 says this. Consider it a great joy. My brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials. Verse 3 says, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Verse 4, and let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. On Wednesdays, Audrey and I are welcoming 18 to 29 year olds in our home the young adults of great team 29, I would encourage you to be there. We're studying verse by verse through James. And, and so some weeks ago, we looked at this specific passage. And, and it's, so, it's so interesting to have this conversation with a younger generation. Because this is so counter to what the world has to say. How can there be joy in the midst of trials? How, how can you experience a calm when it's chaos? Scripture teaches James is writing Jewish believers that have been scattered abroad. Why were they scattered abroad? Because they had faced great persecution and so they, they dispersed. James is writing those that have dispersed, those that have faced trials. And so the recipients, the original recipients, they would have known what he's talking about here. They would have known it to be true. And he says, consider it great joy. Well, brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials, there can be joy in the midst of the trial. Why? Because there has never been a moment that the Lord has forsaken you or he's forsaken me. There has never been a moment that God has thrown up his hands and said, I'm done. I quit. Hear me clearly today. There can be great joy in the midst of the affliction, pain, trial that you're facing right now. Why? Because we have a Savior who has endured it all for us. He went to the cross willingly, humbly, facing agony and affliction as his blood began to We see in this James text, he says, you know, the testing of your faith produces, there, there's something that comes from it, and it's endurance, it, it, it's perseverance, it's to keep on going, it's to keep on fighting. And then he says in verse 4, and, and let endurance have its full effect, so that, don't miss this, you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. This is God's desire that you and I would come to such a place where we say, God, you're all that I need. You are my joy. You are my satisfaction. You are my, my, my hope. I depend fully upon you. See, here, here's what's happening in all of this. God never wastes a hurt. There, there's not one hurt or one pain or one trial or one affliction that you have endured that God ever wastes. God never wastes any of the past. He never wastes any of your experiences and so the question today is, what pain have you endured that the Lord wants to use you to minister to others? It's a personal question, but I pray that you would, you would take it seriously, that you would write that question down and you would ask the Lord until he answers you. Continue to knock until he opens that door. What pain have you endured that the Lord wants to use you to minister to, to others? It's a simple next step. The simple next step is this. Within a context of a church family like Discovery, 
is what ministry is the Lord calling you to? Now, how do we know what He's calling us to, but what He's seen us through? <laughs> and somehow He takes the experience, and He takes the pain, and He, 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 he takes all that we've learned, and we're able to walk along somebody that's going through the very same thing. God never wastes a hurt, pain, affliction, trial. Verses 12 through the end of the chapter, we see that Esau comes back to Jacob and he says, hey, let's move on. You see that verse, verse 12? Esau said, let's move on and I'll go ahead of you. And so Jacob replies, hey, I can't. We had too many weak, we had too many children, we had too many weak animals. So you go on, you go on. And I'll follow. Well, as we continue to read, we see that Jake, Jacob doesn't follow. In fact, the next time they'll meet back up is to bury their father, Isaac. You, you can read ahead. It's okay. See, Jacob wants reconciliation. But he doesn't want a relationship. It, it's probably a whole other message that we don't have time for, but, but there is a point in this. That God has called all of us, each of us, to be ministers of reconciliation. Paul tells the church in Corinth that this is so. That we're ambassadors for Christ. We go. We plead with people, be reconciled to God. This is the message. This is the, the hope. This is the gospel. Be reconciled to God. Jacob wants reconciliation with his brother, but, but he doesn't want a relationship. I don't know if there's someone that has crossed your path that has, that has hurt you deeply. And perhaps today, you're still holding on to some hurt, some bitterness. Maybe it's turned into some anger. Maybe if you did see them, a fight would break out. Police would be called or something. I, I don't know. Maybe you find yourself like Jacob. As he looks up and he sees Esau coming with his 400 men, and he doesn't know what to expect. The challenge is we close is this way. Would you pursue reconciliation? Allow the relationship, whatever else it looks like, happen as God's will be done. Would you at least pursue reconciliation as one who is growing in the Lord, one who is walking with the Lord? Would you pursue this, this reconciliation? We see that Jacob and his, and his crew, they, they arrive <coughs> they, they arrive at, at Shechem. They, they, they come to this place called Sokoth. We see that in verse 17. But they arrive at Shechem. And then what does he do in verse 20? He sets up an altar there and, and calls it God, the God of Israel. So he arrives and he sets up this altar and he begins to worship God. In, in all of this, for the past 20 years, Jacob has been outside the land of promise. But what I want us to hear as we close today is that never for one Minute has Jacob been outside the hand of promise. God has continued to meet his every need, even though he has been outside the land of promise. He's never been outside the hand of promise. And I want you to hear me clearly today. Some of you have been buying into the lies of the enemy. And today it is. Today, as we just get before the Lord for a moment. Today, if, if these thoughts of oh, the Lord can never use me, or I'm always going to feel this kind of a way. If you've been buying into the lies of the enemy, I want you to know that what we have offered to us is the grace of God. Paul and his affliction. He cries out to God three times. You remember what he, what he says, his response. After he realizes the affliction is still going to be there, this is what he says. Your grace is sufficient for me. This is what the Lord responds. Hey, my grace is sufficient for you. And, and I want you to hear 
the same thing today. God's grace is available. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes all across this place? Those who are joining us online, would you take a moment? This isn't over. We're not done. We're not packing up. This might be one of the most critical times of the entire worship gathering. To just get alone with God for a moment. I say, God, what, what do you want me to do with all of this? Maybe, maybe there's some deep hurt that, that you've never surrendered over to the Lord. You've never be, 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 began the healing process. And today would be the day that it begins. Today would be the day that it begins. And so would you, would you just surrender? Surrender that hurt, surrender that pain, surrender that affliction, surrender the trial. Would you just surrender it over to him? And as you do that, would you just say, Lord, how do you want to use this? If it's true that you never waste a hurt, how do you want to use this for your glory? How do you want to use me to minister to others? Here's my life. For the rest of my days, take and use me. As people are praying that across the room and those online are praying, maybe there's someone here that's never surrendered over to the Lord Jesus. This would be the first step of healing. It starts in a relationship with Jesus. If that's you, something stirring within you, tug at your heart saying, I need Jesus. Would you call on right where you're at? Would you say something like, Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I trust you to save me completely. For, forgive me of all my sins. I believe in you that you came to this earth, died on a cross, you were placed in a grave, and you rose on that third day for me. So I trust you. I trust you. And I'm going to live the rest of my life for you. That's your prayer. Would you thank him for saving you?